We have two more sessions in the IT for IT uh, stream this afternoon. The first is led by Lars, the Chief Architect of IT for IT at HP, whom you've met before. And it's my pleasure to introduce friend and colleague Richard Arnink from ACMEA in the Netherlands. So I will leave the floor to them. After their session, we have uh, a Q&A panel um, when we can invite questions to all of the speakers that we've heard since lunchtime. So Lars, Richard, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick it off uh, in opposite direction of this. So I'm the last and Richard is there, right? But you figured that out already. Um, the, uh, what we're going to talk to uh, today, or not today because we've been talking a lot today, but uh, in this session <laughs> would be around this concept of this service backbone and what that really implies. And then also put it into context of uh, a real company doing real work with IT for IT and, and what the benefits uh, have been doing that. And Richard will, uh, will represent that part of it. The first part uh, in the introduction uh, will be around why is the CMDB and CMS concept not really working today? So it links a little bit back to the, um, the ITIL discussion that uh, uh, Charlie and myself was, was discussing earlier in the day. And, uh, and it's a slightly provocative statement that it doesn't work because a lot of people are implementing these kind of things and are getting results out of it. Uh, but what we are making a case for here is that um, it can only get you so far and you need something more than what is currently being described in, say, the, the ITIL books uh, around this stuff. <clears throat> so we're not saying that ITIL is wrong, but almost. <laughs> That was the closest I could get to being political correct here. So, <clears throat> um, the, the, the IT value chain, as we discussed, is really sort of going all the way from, from the planning part and over to the, uh, to the consumption and, and running part of, of the stuff. And if you look at how you organize your things, it's very much around the processes. ITIL is, is a lot around describing what do you need to do in all of these various stages. So when you start at the, at the left-hand side, the, the strategy to portfolio side, you run into the business leader. They're looking at, 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 at demands and business process modeling. So not IT process model, but business process modeling. How are you doing um, insurance processes and, 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 and what uh, have I when you sell insurances, for instance? Uh, what are the policies, the company policies? policies that needs to be applied, which of course then propagates down into real demand that IT needs to deliver in order to support these business uh, processes. And then by some strange means it becomes handed over to somebody that actually developed this stuff, right? And so this demand gets translated into requirements at some point um, and being evolved through, in, through IT projects and, and, and being developed, uh, defects being discovered during the process, etc. And that's all very good and fine. And at some point we say the agile process is now done, we've done our 10 sprints, and that is what you get here. It's now in production. Well, I know that DevOps would put it into production a number of times during that process, but, but somehow, nevertheless, and it could also be waterfall process, you, you, uh, you request some changes in the operational requirement, uh, environment, you put it into uh, uh, to production, uh, you start running incidents uh, uh, and problem processes around it, uh, you, you just check the events and maybe, by the way, also you start managing the subscriptions that is associated with these services, who's actually consuming the services at the end of the day. Though again, the concept of subscription and how to manage that is not really well described in a lot of the existing process standards. You would, uh, and, and that's sort of a side note into this standard discussions we had earlier, uh, you might want to go to Etom to see how to do that because the telco industry have done the cloud consumption model for 100 years. Uh, plus, actually. So it's nothing new. Uh, telco has always been a cloud business before we invented that term, way before. Uh, so, so we actually went in and, and used some of that to, to innovate that, and Richard will come back to, to that later. But what do happen is that somehow we try to move all of that down into a physical service model, the CMDB, right? And, and so the CMDB classically is something that is 
initially being introduced in the operational environment because you have chaos and you can't figure out is this event important, not important, what is running on it. So in order for operations to work, you put the CMDB in place and in order to populate it, you put some kind of discovery process in place. And then hopefully you also through the process of, of the request for change, you start managing it a little bit more systematic of making sure that you actually update the CMDB now it's starting to look like a CMS in, in ITIL terms, uh, according to the change that is coming down the pipe. But if you do move backwards into the development and, and the, the planning side, then the link into what is there in the CMDB is pretty weak to say the least. Um, you might try to do it. I know some organization that has tried to do that and have in general not been very successful with that. So that's, that's a real issue, right? Now, uh, I have a history, a uh, legacy, so to speak, in the telco industry. That's why I'm referring to ETOM and why I've been stealing from ETOM what I believe is the best uh, of, of ETOM. But one of the things I noticed in the telecom industry is that they were struggling with some of the same problems uh, 10 years ago. And they, uh, <clears throat> they started putting in place inventory systems. And, and, and there was a trend about 10 to 15 years ago where they had inventory projects. They were enormous. Uh, they really put hundreds of millions of dollars into creating them to, in order to actually figure out what is going on. I tend to call it the mother of all databases where you just keep everything in there and then, then you're done, then you are in control. They all, without exceptions, well, there might be one exception, but I haven't heard about it, failed, right? The concept of trying in the operational, in the process environment, to create a single system that just contains all of that is virtually impossible. You might be able to do it within an industry where all of this is controlled by a single vendor. You're, 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 you are a single organization. So if you go to the, not the IT domain, but say the ERP domain with SAP, et cetera, you could do something like that. But even SAP is not actually trying to do that any longer because it's, it is just very problematic. You are very much locked in. So can we do it differently? And you can. <clears throat> so you've seen this before. It's the, the value chain, the, the, uh, uh, the four uh, essential value streams that, that you need to, to manage in IT. I uh, won't explain that in more detail today. Um, but if you look at it, saying, sort of look at it at, in terms of there is something going on between them. There is a handover. And again, I want to stress here, because that has been misunderstood by many people reading it initially, we're not advocating that this is a waterfall, right? You do all of this half a year, then you hand it over, and then you do this part in, in another development cycle for nine months, and then you hand it over, and, and it's, it's, there's certainly interaction back and forth. There is a continuous uh, interaction between these places. And actually, what it also indicates is that there is an evolution of the model of the service that IT deliver. So the demand comes in saying, I need a new account receivable uh, system, or I need a new time tracking system, or I need a new application for, for uh, analyzing results from drilling for oil or something like that. And it comes in here, and it initially is a conceptual service model. These are the business requirements. And they go into development, but they also go back again and saying, well, this is possible, this is not possible, and get revalidated with the business if you run in an organization that is agile. But it requires that you have something to work on, right? So you could say that, in essence, you really need to have a conceptual service model, a logical service model, and a realized or physical service model that interact. So the first one focused on the portfolio, uh, on the business side. The middle one really on how do you actually develop this? Uh, how is it constructed? And the final point, what does it look like when it's in production? And there are two things you can say about these information models. The first one is that it's really a refinement model, right? That initially it's a very abstract entity. You don't, you just say, I, 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 need, a, I need a time tracking system. And, that's, and then the next thing you say is that, okay, and it needs to deliver these capabilities to the business. How you actually deliver it? Is it a, 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 my own application in a tier tier uh, uh, way that, that there has a, a mobile front end or whatever? Or is it a module in SAP? Or is it, what is it, right? That's something you design here. 
And then finally, uh, when, when, you, uh, when, when you realize it, you go down to saying these are the services run on or these are the cloud service providers is being, being uh, pushed to or et cetera, et cetera. These are the IP numbers it's, it's on, et cetera. Much more details in the final one. But there's another thing as well, and that's the one to N relationship that is indicated here on the arrow, which is to say that you might have a single conceptual service design that, that says I need time tracking, but you might have several very different logical designs. You might have an existing time tracking system that you still evolve on, it's version 3.x, right? And, and, and you, you need some extra features, so you design a mobile front end or whatever, but you actually in parallel are thinking, well, I'm gonna scrap some of these and we're gonna build one time track system to, uh, <laughs> to rule them all, and that becomes a completely separate uh, logical design. They're all related to the same conceptual one because it still needs to deliver the same stuff, but they're very different in design. And similar, when you go into production, it might very well be that you have, you have uh, developed or insourced a time tracking application uh, that, that serves your need. You can validate them back with, with what the business need, but you actually deploy it several places, right? You deploy one in, in EMEA and you deploy one in Americas, uh, and there are different instances because of response time and what how I actually want to run to, right? And it might be very okay to do. Or you could say that, that I have one in production and I have another one which is in, in early production test and I have one in, 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 in pre-production test or, or whatever, right? And, and some of them you monitor more than others, but, but it really is essentially different copies of the same logical model. <clears throat> Trying to do all of that in a single uh, big repository where you just have everything in uh, tends to be quite complicated. Also from the fact that you probably use very different IT systems in these various parts. You also, <coughs> excuse me, might very well uh, have outsourced part of it so that you don't have necessarily uh, control over what tool chains are being used for part of it. So if you take that and look into it in, in more detail, then what, what happens is that around the service model, we have a number of these artifacts that we talked about earlier, the key artifact, the 25 artifacts that are, that are really controlling IT, and they associate with either the conceptual, the logical, or the, the, the uh, physical service model. Over here at this end, the conceptual service model, it's stuff like the demand object, or, or which is, oh, we did a name change in the latest version, so I have to remember what we ended up agreeing on in the consortium of, of, of users of this. It's a portfolio backlog item, so fundamentally things that I want into my portfolio. Uh, or it's the investment budget, right, that, that is uh, uh, associated with the conceptual service model. And the logical service model, that's typically the defects and the requirements and uh, uh, et cetera that you have there. And then finally, <coughs> the physical service model where you have the, the, the concept of, say, the, the events and the incidents, et cetera, because it's all related to stuff that is actually running. The physical service model is the model that you typically are more used to see because that's, that's where you have the configuration items. That's the things you can go and touch and, and change, <laughs> etc. So they, they are the ones you can configure. And then it can come into an, a, an almost religious war about, well, is these things that are conceptual also configuration items in nature or not? Um, personally, I don't really care. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we understand what you capture here and that it can be kept separate from the next stages in here. There is a little extra thing coming in on, on the top here, which is another thing that we realized around the service model is that if IT is to become much more a service broker or service provider in nature, <coughs> excuse me, I've had a cough the past couple of days and uh, this is my second speaking opportunity, so I hope it will last me. Uh, <coughs> else I'll hand it over to Richard to do the rest of it. <laughs> is that traditional IT, again, is saying, well, we, we, we plan, we build, we run, right? Plan, build, run. You've seen that mantra many places in IT. That's actually not what we are saying in IT for IT. We say plan, build, consume, run. 
Right. That consume part is very important, and it's not just one extra little function that sits there. It's an entire value stream. That's, uh, that, that's, that's pretty big, actually. And if you look into ITIL, uh, et cetera, it's very difficult to see that. Uh, they do talk about consumption, et cetera, but, but to us it's a much bigger thing. And that's part of changing the, the business. And consumption is something you do from the logical service model in towards operations. So I consume something it implies that I'm looking at what capability is possible based on the logical design, and then I instantiate those capabilities in the production. The, the place where you see that most today in the industry is the cloud providers, right? They design the concept of infrastructure as a service, put it in the catalog, and then you, there's nothing that is running. They just design some infrastructure you can consume, and then you can consume it, and it becomes realized. But that is actually taking place in, in much more than just infrastructure as a service. It should really happen within the IT organization uh, themselves with everything you do. Often, in order to put something in the catalog, you need to put in some uh, basic capability or basic service systems in place, and you would still push them sort of more directly, release, deploy into the environment. So there's kind of two ways stuff happens in, in, uh, in the operational domain, according to the IT for IT. The, the traditional way <laughs> that puts the systems in place, and then the consumption part, which is really driven by the uh, in consumers. And all of that needs to be governed by service model. And it's also remember or, or see here that we constantly talk about service models, not about applications or infrastructure. Infrastructure is delivering service. Applications are delivering service. You need to think about service. That's also another change. Now, again, if you read ISO, they also talk about service, absolutely. Then we can come into a discussion about is the definition of the word service actually the same? Uh, last open group event, uh, in Boston, we had a discussion with, uh, with a group of people called Taking Service Forward. Um, any representation from TSF here? Okay, but anyway, um, but they were looking at saying, well, how can we better actually describe everything as a service? And it turns out there is a, an awful lot of advances in starting to think that way. But it's a roadmap. It's not something IT will just uh, do over, overnight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a transition. Now, we then drilled into saying, well, what is it really you have in these three areas? And we actually get to a little bit more refined model when we get down into what are the individual data objects, the key artifacts you want to maintain within the conceptual, the logic, and the realized one. On the conceptual service model, there are actually two things. There is the conceptual service itself, which is kind of just a container saying, I need time tracking. And then there is conceptual blueprints, which is fundamentally trying to keep track on what are the agreed set of features from a business perspective that the, uh, is being delivered as time tracking. So that allows you to build out a roadmap of what you want to do. And you can start doing all kinds of interesting planning activities around uh, the conceptual service and conceptual service blueprint if you can track them. <clears throat> Moving into the logical domain, that's where you would not be surprised about, well, it makes sense to create a logical service blueprint or a logical design, if you will. That is really supposed to capture, well, when I start developing stuff, I make some design decisions. Uh, some organizations are very structured around that. They have architects sitting here, which are sort of the borderline between enterprise architect and software architect that, that figure out, well, this is actually what I want to do, and, and they do all the detailed design. And then there's some programmers that look at these designs, which can be Word documents or, or uh, uh, Sparks, uh, UML diagrams of various sorts, etc. cetera. Um, what we have recognized is that in, in many organizations, unfortunately, these artifacts are being created initially, uh, read by the first set of programmers, and then forgotten about and never maintained. Right? And they are also often, especially if they are documented in Word documents, very difficult to access. Right? Uh, you might have a document control system where you can find it, but, but it's still sort of, well, you can't actually do analysis on them necessarily. Uh, and now we can have a longer discussion about big data and what you can do on unstructured data, et cetera. But, but let's, let's, uh, let's park that for now. Um, in the agile community, it's typically worse <laughs> than, than uh, the, these things doesn't seem to be captured. What, what is more uh, 
normally capture these uh, requirements in terms of user stories, and then you just go ahead and refine, 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 and eventually get something that looks beautiful and performs reasonable well. Uh, and and but but what did you actually do? So if you onboard new people, it can actually be very difficult to get into understanding what was taking place in in these agile uh, scenarios. And that is not to say that agile is wrong. I'm just saying there are certain disciplines that you should be very careful about not forgetting in the process of trying to be smarter. But there is another aspect of the logical uh, <coughs> service design, which has to do with the release that goes out. And we call it service release and service release blueprint. Uh, the service release is fundamentally a capture of saying, well, I am planning out a certain set of releases with a certain set of, of uh, features being implemented. You could sort of, uh, where, where I'm also talking about releases here, really, uh, that's typically, in a very, very simplistic mindset, this would be the major ones, <laughs> right, where you say, well, the business wants something new and better of some sort, where the releases over here really determine what are the individual chunks of stuff I want to put into production in order to get to the level of eventually satisfying all the requirements that came in from the business side, right? Uh, and, and, and the reason why I need two uh, becomes a little bit of a, of a uh, I wouldn't call it a technicality, it's actually pretty important, but, but there's a lot of details in it. Where this one fundamentally describes, you have a new service release whenever you actually fundamentally add features to what you do. You could imagine, for instance, in an agile world, it would be, uh, be the end of each sprint. You have a, a new release. It doesn't need to be that way, but that could be. So every three weeks, you would have something like that. Or in a more waterfall, you planned out and say, I have, a, I have an early access release. I have a, 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 a beta release uh, and an alpha in between, I guess, and, and what have I, right? where the service release blueprint are actually the ones that are completely specifying this is the package I'm handing over, right? Which is very important because in production, this is the reference you go back to and say, this is what I, this is what I put into production. If you do a single patch, if you do a single bit change, you create a new one of these so that you fully can track it. Now, in, uh, in Agile, again, if we look at the, the bigger diagram, they, they talk about the concept of a built typically. And you could say, well, the service release blueprint is kind of equivalent to a build. But there's this one thing that we also recognize is that where a lot of these DevOps guys or agile guys in combination of these, they have this very advanced pipeline or, or tool chain that allows you to constantly iterate and put stuff in production here. They are typically not taking into account where well, they're only part of a slightly larger environment where whatever they put out in, in these uh, very agile way might interact with, say, the, uh, some APIs on SAP that they're also replying on another team that upgrades the SAP API uh, for the time tracking, right? Uh, and that might not be developed in the same uh, form, but this one keeps track on all of these dependencies. The final part of the service model is the desired, and you can't read this, but I'll read it loud then, desired service model, or CIs, and the actual service model. <clears throat> now, if I go back to the CMS descriptions in ITIL, these two things are to some degree actually collapsed into one. It is really a state transition that you manage the state of is a, a particular CI in production or not production, is this change going to happen or not happen? What we are arguing for is that it actually makes sense to split it up. And there are a couple of reasons for that. They're easier to illustrate if you go to this diagram, which you've seen a couple of times before. So these are the components that are actually controlling uh, the, the uh, reference architecture or uh, the, the uh, information model. <clears throat> and where the actual service CIs or the actual service model is very equivalent to what you typically see in a CMDB. You would have a reasonable, complete picture of what it, or you should have, I'm not saying you do have, but you should have a reasonable, good picture of what is actually in production. But that might not really be what you intended to have in production. The, the system that understands what you really should have in, in production should be the, uh, what is in, in the generic term here called the fulfillment execution component, the one that is responsible for pushing stuff into production. 
And again, in many organizations, this is a manual process, right? It's, it's, uh, it's controlled by IFCs, and, and you do all the stuff. You configure a server, you put the software on, you configure it, et cetera. But we're all moving towards something that becomes more and more automated. And that automation system would really control what it desires to go into production. And what we then also see is that in any given organization, you will have a number of these functional components in place. You would have one that is very good at doing infrastructure for cloud. You have another one that is good at application layer. You have a third one that is good at providing uh, laptop services, right? They, they function very differently. They each have a concept of desired service, but they live in different systems, and they need to interact. Where the CMDB here would be much more focused not on what technology, but what data center it goes into. So you sort of have a, a when you're lo looking in a, an outsourced and multi-supply environment, the organization and the people and the systems responsible for the desired service is end to end related to the, to the uh, organization systems that are responsible for what exists in the data centers. And therefore, they cannot live in the same system. They need to be split up. <coughs> I see a number of people all saying, is that really true? Uh, <laughs> And, and that's fair. I mean, if you just say, yeah, that sounds uh, reasonable, then, then, then I'm, I would be scared that you weren't really thinking about it. Uh, but uh, that service backbone here is a very essential part of what we're doing in IT for IT. That is how we actually, at the end of the day, tie all the rest in, but still being able to do it in a distributed manner across multiple suppliers, etc. So. With that, I'll hand it over to, to Richard that has tried to take some of these concepts but also be part of developing some of these concepts. Thank you very much, uh, Lars. Um, how do I advance slides? With which? <laughs> you want to press the wrong one? No, exactly. Page, page down. Thank you very much. So I'm going to um, tell you a little bit more of request to fulfillment as we started in 2008 uh, looking at um, the materials that were presented by, uh, by Carol. Um, we found that one value stream was missing namely request to fulfillment. Um, we had discussions in our company, Achmea, um, which is a merger company, and I'll have a slide a little, little more details on our problems. But um, basically what we, what we had was an internal distribution um, department uh, delivering services for end users, IT services for end users, I have to say. Um, they delivered all these IT services themselves, there were no vendors involved. They acquired the hardware themselves. Um, and whenever um, an end user called with a specific question, a specific demand, they looked in, at the capabilities of other vendors and they delivered the service. So um, in the end, we had an end user catalog that exploded with a number of services that were not no longer standardized in any way. Um, and there was no um, means of getting um, as a smaller and standardized set of, uh, of services other than when we would actually look at it from a broader perspective. And, and we did it in looking at this picture and started discussing within our company how do we actually make sure that we get more standardized uh, end user services um, and also relate or solve other problems that we have in our company as well. And we look at a little bit more detail here. Um, this is the level two, if I'm correct, because it's not, not a formal uh, representation yet, but this, this was our discussion uh, slide when we, go, when we actually discussed, sit down with our business and discussed what are our problems. One of our problems were the exploding catalog, catalog of, um, um, of services, but the other one, a very important one, was that we actually had no track on showback and chargeback because we used CI administration to do the, char the, the chargeback and showback, but in the process of delivering all kinds of requests, some of them got mixed up a little bit and not all the CI were correct. So um, and in, in time when some materials broke uh, and got disposed, um, the showback and chargeback was actually still going on where the uh, IT service was no longer delivered. Um, to keep um, a more um, coherent set of, of services, um, we started drawing a picture, and that's this picture. 
Um, it's quite difficult to read and it's late already, so I will not try to bore you with every detail of it. But the new thing in this is actually that we created the offer catalog component, um, the service catalog entry, and created a link to the, um, to the service backbone that Lars just described. On the other hand, we, ex uh, we added an offer, which is the commercial um, setting of, the, of the, the service that we want to provide so that a specific same service, technically the same service, can be offered to different departments, technically the same, but to different chargebacks, um, um, uh, types of chargebacks, or even um, we can discuss whether or not a specific audience has a right to order a specific service. The other new thing is that we have a subscription to manage that we actually do the chargeback only when we have a, a subscription in place. We created that artifact so we ensure that whenever we deliver a service, a subscription is being created and whenever we change a, a, a service, so there's a new request for changing the service that is being delivered, we also change the subscription. And that is then tied back to the chargeback or showback, whatever you would like to, to have. And the other thing is that we also now have a link to assets, which is down here, um, and the fulfillment execution engines. Because in the couple of years that followed after 2008, we got other um, partners in delivering the IT services as well. So all of a sudden, we have to broker between different IT partners delivering parts of the service, and we had to make sure that the components that make up the service actually are being constructed into an actual service that we can deliver to our end customers. So in this engine, the fulfillment execution engine, is now responsible for making sure that all the fulfillment and deployment <laughs> engines, all also other external parties, IT suppliers, make, uh, get their part of work being distributed to them and either automate delivery of it or manually deliver that part of the components of the service. Um, it very much helped that we actually could draw this picture and then map our existing systems at that time to this picture. So now you see the backdrop here, the components that we saw on the previous picture, and I looked for applications that fulfilled or partly fulfilled the capabilities of the components. And we quickly found that there's a lot of components that actually were not existing within our company. They were manually tasks, that, which is very expensive, there were a lot of errors made in that area, and one of the objectives was to standardize, but also to speed up the delivery of those components, of those services, therefore automating the delivery of it. Um, we also found that there were systems which we created ourselves. There were systems that are of SAP. There's, there was a lot of, in the usage area, where we do the monthly or weekly chargeback, there were a lot of Excel systems being used, Excel sheets. Um, and we had a part of the organization that was already looking at Microsoft orchestration components to deliver components automatically. Now we have a picture that is simple, simple enough to go to management and explain, look, we have a, we have a problem. There is overlap in, in, in uh, capability in, in applications that are fulfilling the same functional component, which is not bad in itself, but can be bad. Um, but also we have gaps. Um, and that made it very easy for us to discuss uh, a project that is now take on the way, delivering this request to fulfillment value stream with a standard tool set. Looking at the delivery of end user services, but also infrastructure services with ATOS, um, where we tie the actual um, um, fulfillment engines of ATOS to our own systems, making Achmea the real um, service broker. So we had um, the bigger picture. I also explained that the need of integrations with our vendors was more clear, and, and we could explain that also to the vendors, what we expect from them. Um, and what we will do is more in future, ask for standard integration, so that whenever a new vendor 
um, comes in, we can say these are our services. We would like you to deliver a deployment engine for your services, and this is the service that we want will provide you to actually um, deliver those services. But also there is a, a information stream going back to update the, the CIs and the other picture that we've shown, and maybe I have to simply show it. Whenever we talk that kind of services, we discuss all of the integrations needed depicted by this picture. There's, in other areas, we have also uh, similar, similar kind of discussions because Achmea is a very architectural driven um, company. So what we do is discuss um, the, in the IT for IT space that all of this is uh, being modeled out in our internal uh, architecture uh, department where we create Archimate pictures for this and we start mapping all of the applications in a similar way that we that have shown earlier uh, to, these, to, to this backdrop, helping us to distinguishing between what are the uh, integrations there, what are the integrations missing, but also if you look at our landscape where we deliver um, insurance policy systems consisting of SAP, Microsoft, um, and Pega and all other types of legacy applications that we build over the last 30 years. Um, how do we actually manage that? And this picture would help us very much in actually making sure that we get more grip, more um, um, insight in how we do that. And I would like to hand over to Lars to uh, summarize. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. So it's been very fruitful in, in our work together with, uh, in, in the consortium because ACMEA like, actually took a lot of the early versions of the ideas. Um, of course, Richard was, was uh, scared whenever we then changed it. Early versions of things like this tend to change. I think we are getting to a reasonable, stable one, but we still have a number of outstanding questions where we would like to work with, with more companies in, in, in figuring out what is the right way of doing it. We didn't have time today to also take, uh, say, for instance, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, um, but Sue has been working very much uh, within the consortium on the on the detect to uh, no sorry requirement to uh, <laughs> deploy area not detect to correct but the requirement to deploy so development area the build area and, and again looking at how are all of these things uh, actually working in, in a nice manner <clears throat> but that will be for another day so to summarize up uh, and uh, yeah we were here on, on the last one uh, so one part was the service backbone that is a new concept. It's a very important new concept in IT for IT, and to understand what that implies is, is important. Uh, we believe that is very innovative and will allow you to actually connect much better all the various parts of IT. And the second part was the, in terms of real innovation here, would be around the R2F, all of that consumption part, which is not traditionally being done so much, but it's not just a, a, again, a piece of paper, a theoretical piece of work, but we work closely with, with companies you know, as a consortium on, on figuring out what makes sense for you as an organization, and, and Richard is actually implementing part of this as we speak. So that's pretty exciting. So with that, uh, we are five minutes before time, but uh, uh, so there are time for questions before we go into the question round, or maybe we should just go into the... Uh... <laughs> so if there are questions specific to the material that uh, Richard and Lars have presented, we can take those now. And then in a few minutes I'll invite Charlie and Case and Georg back up to the platform and we'll run a full panel for you on the afternoon's work. But I think once again we've... Uh, a searching question from our friend over on the far side there. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. It's nice to be called a friend. It's nice to be <laughs> um, Richard, I was quite interested to, uh, to hear or to learn more about the perceived value that you have received in your organization by applying these frameworks yeah. or to uh, execute the activities you just outlined since 2009. 
do you have any kind of a rather than uh, untangible value like uh, better agility, better flexibility, or better visibility? Do you or have you done any kind of commercial value assessment in terms of what's the impact to an organisation uh, from a commercial perspective for applying or applying such a uh, process? I think that's a little bit too early uh, for now. But if you look, uh, if you look at it, at this um, within Armia, there's a lot of pressure on costs. Uh, the insurance market in the Netherlands is um, saturated a lot, so the, the the cost of one policy is needs to go down. And if uh, my personal opinion is that if we never we get this service backbone in place, we get a far more better. Um, knowledge on how much one policy, one insurance policy, would actually cost us from an IT perspective. Um, but it's a long way to actually getting there. I could, I could maybe add to, uh, to speaking also to other customers of HP where we implement the, the R2F uh, part. It's a lot around uh, this is a taxonomy that gives you an ability to implement automation uh, in a big way. There's a lot of project that goes on, oh, let's build another engine that can automate something, or let's put in some more workflows that is automated in, in whatever automation technology you have. But this actually gives you a way of structuring how you do that automation. And that helps uh, a number of our, our clients to, to, to find out. An important piece that wasn't, uh, isn't easy to just read out of this, it is in the white paper, so, uh, is that, between sort of the, the offer part and the composition component here, that's two sides of the catalog, there's actually an aggregation going on. If it's implemented in the right manner, these are actually different systems, right? So you have a single place where you go in and you manage all subscription to all departments, to all lines of business, but it's a thin layer that only concentrate on the commercial aspects or how you present it. And then you have several systems beneath that are specializing in particular technology like uh, private cloud or SAP application modules or whatever, right? Um, and, and they will be different, but you aggregate them into a single place. And, and, and that, that creating that kind of taxonomy suddenly makes it much more clear what to do and where to concentrate. I think, um, added to your question, um, we, we did, of course, make a business case for implementing request to fulfillment. And we found that whenever we do it right, and we can automate, let's say, 90% of all the activities, we could um, reduce the number of FTEs within that department by roughly 20 to 25. That's a lot. Um, but if you look at, at this um, maturity that we are currently today, um, the, we will not meet that 90% yet. That's one. Um, reality that we have to face. And the other one is that those are people that are not actually being put on the street, but we need those people otherwise in the, in the IT department to solve other problems that we currently can deal with. So business case is very, it, it, if I would ask my CIO, they, he would say to me, Name the name of name me the name of the persons that actually would leave the IT department because then I would have a real benefit. But um, it's, it's not always quantity, it's mm. quality as well. Okay. Thank you. Regarding the service model backbone, how do you position the service-oriented service architecture? <coughs> right. It sits there. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, so... so <coughs> The uh, and again, well, I could I could go back with a question. What do you mean by service-oriented architecture? Uh, and and in the sense that there is a couple of different interpretation of what it really entails and how big that concept is, right? Um, the if if I go back uh, some years and 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 service-oriented architecture was all the rage of 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 how we would get the new style of IT. Well. That's maybe five, ten years ago when that started, and we should be there today, but we are not there today. And one of the reasons, in my view, is that this part never actually really got managed. And so, and, and this part being the logical service design. 
and, and, and then you could say, well, I know companies that are doing it very well. They're using, uh, say, rational tools from, from IBM that, that can actually really manage all of these service endpoints and understand the dependencies, uh, et cetera. And then once you do that, you can start act because the important part of these service models is that they have dependencies, right? You shouldn't develop monolithic application. You should de develop services that depends on each other. And you should actually be able to track it all the way up to the conceptual service so that you can make decisions about those dependencies. And the service-oriented architecture is the governance structure of saying, is it really true that we have these dependencies? And, and how do we also design reusable things that can be used, at least in, in, in my interpretation of service-oriented architecture? So service-oriented architecture fits very nicely into this concept and can help you in, in actually make it usable because the problem we have today is often you have some nice service-oriented architecture work going on there, but when it actually gets deployed, a lot of this information disappears and, and are not reusable, and then you're losing a lot of the value, and you can't either see it up at the, uh, up at the business level either, and then the value of it becomes much smaller. So this can help make the value of service-oriented architectures much larger. If, if I may, Lars, can I, can I make you a bit more bold? Would it be fair to say that service-oriented architecture generally is a, a faddish type term, it's quite nebulous? We have got a more prescriptive orientation to service. And indeed, there's a white paper amongst the collateral on the forum's website that I would encourage you to take a look at. So Lars has done Service a, model management is, is, yeah. is the white paper. So again, it's, it's, it's a key underpinning concept that we're aware of that we need to fully articulate. Okay, any other questions? In the center there, Steve, thank you. You should take a seat. Oh, okay. we're, 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 we'll start on the panel by sitting there. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you, should, you should be the, the, the fan. We're a very vital focused organization in Norwegian healthcare, thanks to HP, by the way. <laughs> uh, you say that I don't only take you this far. So in the common language, if I was to address this to management, why should we do this? Uh, common language. What do we gain? Well, we are an idle shop as well. Um, but what I found is that whenever I start talking idle, process owners start um, looking at their process and their process alone. And, and they look at how do I manage my process in a most optimized way. Um, but they are not always aware of what's going on in the other processes that are connected. So presenting this kind of picture, and you could also draw this picture on a process level, of course, um, but presenting this kind of pictures to me helps me um, making sure that process owners that are, for instance, in the area of problem, incident, event, they actually come together, look at detect to correct and understand more how they should work together, optimize it more in a value stream approach. Complementing. That would be also to say that ITIL, as we, we discussed in an earlier presentation today, is more centered around the right-hand side of the picture. <coughs> oh, so turned 180 degrees here. And, and so all of these process optimization might be going better and better within, say, just detect or correct, but their linkage into, say, what is going on in the development side is, is uh, in general, basically missing, right? It's, it's the, the uh, and I've seen uh, CIOs going out and saying, well, they want the developers to go on ITIL training, so at least they understand what the operational guys are doing, right? Um, but he does recognize that, that ITIL only really works for his operational staff, that that's where it has its value. And we're trying to, to go more to that, which would actually benefit ITIL because it, 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 would, it would help enabling the DevOps version of ITIL, in, in my view, as, as one example. Pierre, you had a... Yeah, I actually had a, a, a question. I got a question in a break uh, from, from somebody who's not in the room. That's why I uh, just wanted... And it's very much in context because the guy <coughs> okay, I'll listen to you. And uh, essentially you were saying if you... you, you I tell it's not describe integration. So we need to do it this way. So, okay, I've got all the different processes. I've got a prescription that says, okay, here are the process steps that integrate with other processes. Here's the data handshake. So essentially you get to an automated tool chain. 
right? That that you can get from uh, from looking at iToad. Why isn't that enough? Why is why isn't that enough? <laughs> so what what does the service platform <clears throat> in addition to the tool integrated tool chain approach, which you can easily get? <coughs> Ask us. Oh, uh, Charlie. Well, I'm not sure. Is this on? I'm not sure that you actually do get that just from ITIL. I mean, I, I think to, to both questions, I think, I, I think the key point is a number of us in this room have had the identical experience of looking at ITIL and realizing that at best it was a reasonable statement of requirement. And we still had substantial design and mapping of existing estate to actually start to make sense of how ITIL would work. And in the process of doing that, I came up against all kinds of ambiguities and gaps, you know, from an architecture perspective. And I think that's, I think that Carl, not to put words in your mouth, but Carl had much the same experience. I think Richard has had similar experiences. And so I think the, the thing would be learn, learn from, you know, rather than yet again reinventing this, which you will if you are a company of some size, will find yourself doing, you know, that would be the, the value proposition. I, I'd, I'd like to add to that that if, um, if you do that, and, and so even without the prescription in ITIL, you manage to actually figure out how to, to put the right tools in place. And a lot of vendors are going out with tools that would support you, so you're not starting from scratch necessarily. But if you don't have the service backbone and, 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 and this essential service model, it's very difficult to report out from. Uh, so, so if you want to, to get to a point of actually understanding uh, your, the quality of your conceptual service, right? So, so you're a portfolio planner. How do you really know uh, where the issues are? How do you explore uh, what is going on there? You have maybe five different releases of, of time tracking system, to take that example again. Um, and and uh, in different regions with, with, with whatever. So how do you know what is actually part of that conceptual service? Typically you don't. Well, you can if you run all the spreadsheet exercises, but, but that's, are not really, that's, that's very reactive. Um, so the data model gives you an information model that, that also allows you, so you can go and, and use the buzzword big data. Uh, they're probably not big. I don't think that we have enormous amount of data in, in IT actually, uh, even counting all the events, etc. compared to some other industries and, and what they're doing. But, but the connectiveness, that's the interesting part you can get out of it. And you have to put that in content with one other thing, and that's the fact that pretty much everyone we talk to uh, from an IT department perspective, a multi-vendor and multi-supplier. So there are several IT vendors in to deliver these blue boxes, <laughs> and there are also several uh, partners in terms of delivering the service. So you outsource the, the networking infrastructure to one partner, the application surveyors to another partner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so if you don't have that common language uh, from the data model perspective, so, so you can say, I really want to have information about your incident, and that's the fundamental information I want, then you will never be able to actually manage IT. You can manage the individual process, but you can't manage IT. Cool. Good answers. There's a saying, uh, the guys running the operations at Norwegian Healthcare say that to get in contact with the architects, you need to know someone in NASA to really find these people, because they're high flying. Would this help closing this gap? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's not rocket science, <laughs> to, taking your, your NASA uh, uh, analogy. It's, 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 it's actually just doing what we as IT practitioners are doing for all the other industries. We've done it for, for enterprise uh, management. We've done it in, within the manufacturing industry. We've done it in many different industries. Why are we not doing it for ourselves? And that's, that's as an industry as opposed to individual IT organizations. That's what we're doing here. If I may add to that, I mean, we run workshops with organizations, yeah. basically giving them this picture you see on the screen. And uh, the moment they see it, they start relating, relating to it in a way that they understand. If I then open up a UML type of models and whatever, I lose them completely. If I stick to something simple, they engage with me. So yes, I need those UMLs to really go into the details, understanding how it works and having you know, designs coming out of it, yes. But simplifying it to a level where I can communicate, that's really the power of it. And the, the, the point of what we are constantly doing is, it's not only this picture that is there, we have repositories behind it, we have those details. So 
if there is a choice of this is how we want to work, this is how we want to operate, there is material that they can be brought into, you know, into the organization to help them do the details. And I think that's the power of the reference architecture. And just to come back at another previous question, um, you know, we, we seem to be very much into uh, ITIL is, is, is what it's all about. But actually, when you read the, the, the diagram from, in this case, right to left, the amount of influence of ITIL on those domains is coming less and less. How many of you have actually implemented all ITIL processes that are out there? I mean, it's really a debate on how many areas between different versions. So, depending on where you are, you know, no, I have not seen any organization that has done it exactly the way ITIL prescribed. And that's also the issue that you don't have a common discussion point um, if you just stick to uh, that, that, that way of working. Um, what we said is it's not only ITIL, it's also COVID, it's also TOGA, it's all kinds of other standards that influence the way you talk about how IT operates. And that's the difference. Okay, thanks. <coughs> thanks, Case. I'm reluctant to interrupt the flow, but I want to invite Gail Bock back to the... Are you, are you good there? Okay, then we'll, we'll, we'll stay as we are. So further questions from the floor for the panel? Plus Georg, who is here amongst us. I have a completely different question. It's not content related, but it's related to the, or your plans or the plan of the forum. I for IT forum for developing more content over the next coming months. So what's the kind of the shopping list of things that you or you want to focus on? Ah, come tomorrow because yeah. we have an open house session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <tomorrow>. never mind. <laughs> yeah. That's we, what we did is yeah. uh, we looked at, at the reference um, architecture as it as it stands here and we discussed uh, all the lines. And um, whenever we come back after a couple of weeks we start rediscussing the same lines over and over again. And at some point in time, we decided, let's stop that kind of discussions. Let's, let's look at scenarios. Let's look at scenarios that we can actually implement within our companies. Let look, let's look at the scenarios that we would actually benefit from as our companies. And we had created a short list of those scenarios that we would like to be implemented um, for ourselves. But now we are at a point that we also look at you and your uh, scenarios. So tomorrow we will have a session where we actually list those scenarios and start prioritizing. And I would like to welcome all of you um, to, to actually help us out getting a prioritized list of scenarios in place. Richard, we've got financial and asset management on that list, right? We have, yeah. I know those are looming large for a number of people in conversations we've yeah. had. And I think we'd be, we would be very readily able to um, uh, propose some, some uh, good, strong uh, architectures for, for that domain. Yeah. yeah. Also it, adding to, to, to the list, so, so uh, Case mentioned it a little bit, saying there's something around SLA management, service level management, and, and, and you would see a glaringly hole in, in, in this diagram because you can't see SLM anywhere. But there is actually a place for it. It's sort of a white spot, right? Uh, no, that's not the way we work. But <laughs> but, but we have uh, the the the, uh, the the way we want to work is that we are very much, as Richard is saying, driven by these uh, scenarios or guidance document, and then the result of that would be proposals for change to the normative standard. Uh, so uh, SLM is is one area that we also look into, and there are some proposals for then changing mm -hmm. the normative. And there are two, well, there are several ways it can change the normative standard. Uh, there is one where we say at the even at the level one diagram, as you see up here, we need to add something or modify something. Um, I, I I I don't have a big problem with adding. Uh, or modifying necessarily, but we have to be very, very careful when we do it up there because uh, it, it, uh, that's one of the reasons why we did the layer is that we can have something that is reasonable, stable at the top level. And we think that with all the validation we've done, we are in a pretty good spot. But there are still a few things wrong or missing at that level. At level two, there are more things to be done. At level three, which is where it becomes the Archimate formal repository where we have the attributes to the key artifacts where we also list some of the more auxiliary things that we normally would see associated. Um, that's the area where there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, 
uh, in the incident uh, case exchange, uh, we've, we've come up with something and there are a couple of other proposals, but there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. And, and then in terms of prioritization, we, uh, there is a bandwidth limit to how much we can do in, in one go because we want to make sure everybody, everything is vetted uh, to be consistent. But we try to set it up so that the, uh, if, we, if we imagine that we keep running snapshots uh, in, in whatever cadence, six months or something like that, um, then the guidance document can be ahead of a snapshot. Uh, and then in the next iterations, we decide to take it back. So there's a lot of possibilities for parallelization of the work. So it's really up to how many people are contributing. Yeah. And just to articulate that in time terms, the way that we've organized our time here over the next couple of days is to move from information giving an invitation today to, a, if you will, a recruitment and development function tomorrow. We begin with an open house, then we will spend time with new members, onboarding them and immersing them more deeply in this. And then in the afternoon, we will look at putting you directly in touch with the people that you've seen here today and at previous open group events. So it's continuing to grow that and recruit to the opportunities where we can continue to develop the collateral. So it's a pity that you won't be here tomorrow, but I do hope that your Cap Gemini colleague will maintain that momentum and move things forward. Yeah, Ron is here tomorrow. And that will be great. And did you find that link? I have, thank you. Good. Okay. <coughs> We're going to need to wait for Steve to run the mic over to you. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry to say I missed the uh, talk about how IT for IT uh, fits in the broader standards landscape. So perhaps I should have asked this earlier. But how this model takes a takes advantage of enterprise architecture practice in the company. Does it make a difference if you have an enterprise architect or you don't? Mm. Well, the, the, the first part is that if, if, you, if you have a TOGAF-based enterprise architecture uh, practice, uh, which I assume you have because you are here, <laughs> then, then um, it's very much around the to-be architecture. And then an LCS architecture and finding the difference and and then uh, creating a roadmap based on that. That's a very simplistic way of saying it. But then the IT for IT reference architecture is the vendor independent to be architecture for, uh, well, basically in in our belief any IT organization. Then of course you need to specialize it into a concrete to be architecture for your organization, which will have all the other kinds of prioritization that needs to go into it. Um, so, Richard, that's, that's fundamentally what you've been doing, right? Yeah. yeah. Not sure what I need to add to that. <laughs> um, what we did within our domain architecture for IT for IT is we looked at it to be, as a to be architecture, mapping all existing applications, like I explained, and also finding gaps and created uh, our roadmaps from that. So that's, that's the way how we apply this. Yeah, there's, there's a bi-directional relationship that is almost like a strange loop. Uh, you have uh, the fact that, that enterprise architecture is itself a component, and enterprise architectures are art of, you know, can be seen as an artifact flowing through the value chain or, or initiating the value chain, and yet it also is expressed as an enterprise architecture, and so therefore is a consumer of our domain in TOGAF. Well, think about it long enough, you drive yourself crazy. <laughs> Standard recursion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a second question. Um, I don't totally get what is an artifact. Is it a process? Uh, has it got a budget? Uh, has it got someone responsible for it? Uh, is defined what's the benefit, let's say, that each artifact brings? And, uh, and lastly, uh, are all their artifacts I can see on that slide the same, let's say, level of abstraction, or there are some which are higher or lower level? Okay, I, I heard about six there. You, <laughs> I would definitely encourage you to come to the onboarding session, okay? 
But in the meantime, I'll leave Lars to respond, yeah, since I'll, we are I'll, looking at Lars's precious notation. I'm, 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 I'm not sure I capture all six questions, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the first one is, and, and, and that's, a, that's a real issue with the wording key artifact. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, especially Charlie has helped a lot in, in researching what is the right uh, naming. So we are in a transition phase where we'll also just call it, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, with data object. Data object. Data, data object. Data. So, so, so the word artifact leads people to think about it also being physical and have an asset quality of some sort, which is not the intent. So it's basically just a data object. We need right. a Go ahead. We need a little more meta model work here, but, but in general, what you see here as the circles are largely conceptual entities. Um, so it's an entity relationship model. You can think of them as data, high level data objects. There, are, there is a concept of artifact that is more akin to, say, uncompiled source code or compiled source code assembled into a package. And those are more true, true artifacts in the, in the industry usage, and certainly as you see them expressed in, in standards like UML. And I think we are still settling on some of that nomenclature because we are certainly also interested in that actual, you know, comp those computational uh, artifacts as they go through the value chain. And then you have this, this more almost metadata phenomenon, you know, where you see defect or incident as, in a sense, metadata above the actual comp computational phenomenon. Um, getting down into the weeds here, but you know, to 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 take it uh, simpler is you could say if you if you look at a lot of the the black uh, key data uh, objects, <laughs> uh, if you will, uh, like incident, we keep talking about incident. That's a pretty simple one. It's a record, right? Uh, it's it's reasonable, well understood in the industry. It's not very complex, though. Unfortunately, we're still arguing about what are the ind individual attributes and life cycle states, etc. It should have, but it's fairly simple. If you go down to, say, uh, an actual service model that is fundamentally modeling out what is, uh, say, the, the, uh, the production uh, environment looking like for, say, the time tracking system, then that's a complex thing, right? Consists of a lot of individual configuration items that relates to each other. Uh, what does that look like? That's much more complex. And 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 you could say when it comes to the to the realized one, the the uh, the, the physical ones, that there is a a long history also in the industry around the CMDBs and how do you model in the CMDB? And we basically just want to inherit that. There's no reason for us to reinvent the wheel around that. As you then move to the to the um, to the right in the diagram, it becomes a bit more fussy because there isn't a long transition for modeling that out in details. So if you take something like uh, the, uh, the service release models, the, the, the model that governs a service release, that's actually not necessarily well understood in the industry what that should look like. The best examples we have of, of standardization in that area would be other TOGAF, uh, and a lot of that uh, people in, in, in the industry are, are sampling around uh, TOGAF, which is not an open group standard, but another standard body that, that, that govern that one. Um, Tosca? What do you mean Tosca? Uh, did I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> T's and letters, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean Tosca, sorry for, for confusing everyone here. The, the other one would be uh, um, heat from the OpenStack community. They're actually trying to model exactly that area of, of, of the model. And again, we're saying, well, we don't want to reinvent that wheel. We just say it has a place within the larger uh, uh, organization. All right. Thank you, Lars. All six? Out of all six uh, that, that, that was two of the six, at least. <laughs> do, do please come to the sessions tomorrow. It would be valuable to have your continued, if you will, observation, OK? Thank you. Any more questions? There was a discussion earlier, uh, a question earlier I wanted to respond to when I was still out on the floor, which is what is the value of doing this? And I think that it was addressed to Richard. Um, I wanted to chime in on, on, on that. Um, the, uh, um, as, IT becomes more and more an essential product of, okay, essential component of all of our products. I think it's essential to have a strong capability for managing it, and the value is actually increasingly to be found in your primary value chain. If it's your intent to bring to the market 
a service or a product offering and IT is a larger and larger component of it. It's no longer nuts and bolts and widgets or you know food products or even food products have you know more and more IT in order to bring them to market in a timely way, let alone you know the connected car and the internet of things. Really the risk for not having a, a, a well-managed end-to-end uh, IT value chain is the risk to your company's profitability. And so, you know, it's not a question of how many people can we take out of the data center anymore. No. You know, it's like saying, well, why would I, you know, why would I improve my HR process? You know, I, you know, well, of course you want to improve your HR process and continually improve it because that's how you get qualified people into your organization. Of course, you're going to want to improve your financial processes because you know that's how you govern and control that very critical aspect of your business. Same thing goes for IT. And so I think you know we have to really look at you know what is what is the cost to not having well-managed IT, and increasingly is IT the constraint, you know, to actually bringing things to market? It's no longer in the back office; it moves into the front office and becomes embedded in actually your company's offerings to the market. How can you afford not to do this? I would be that as a as a. <coughs> So are you considering introducing an implementation guideline and the maturity uh, framework, let's say, in order for the IT organizations uh, to gradually implement or align with this IT reference architecture? Well, will you start or? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll pass it. Hot potato. Uh, okay, so speaking purely personally, um, at a high level, maturity frameworks, they seem to make sense. You know, I mean, obviously, you, you, my knowledge is progressive. You can't study calculus unless you have a background in trig and algebra, right? So maturity intuitively makes sense. But I think the maturity frameworks also can be badly abused, and I'm skeptical about some of their usage. Um, I think that there's actually been some serious retrenchment in the United States from, I won't mention the capability framework by name, <laughs> but I'm aware that there's been some very critical studies that have gone on in the Pentagon and have found, you know, actually empirically there isn't any, you know, any value there because they have now large populations of projects that they can compare. You know, you know, the, you know did they use the framework, did they not use the framework? They're not finding statistically any meaningful difference. This is one of the underreported developments in the IT industry in the last few years. However, you know, that doesn't change the fact that it's useful to have, you know, some level of process assessments and benchmarking. And how does, you know, how do, how do you even begin to, you know, have, you know, come in as a consultant and assist somebody if you haven't got, you know, some, some understanding of, well, they want to, they're here and they want to get there. Um, so certainly, I think as we go through the next few days, we are going to have our conversations about, you know, actually turning IT for IT into educational framework, getting into the training and certification and accreditation of the training providers and all of the, the mechanics that are necessary there. How we do that, you know, I will have some opinions about that, um, but I think there's some certain, certain things you just have to do in order to be relevant. I mean, no, I, I mean, <clears throat> within our company. We, uh, we, we do a lot of engagement with customers where we take this reference architecture as a starting point for, for a dialogue and what we can do. And we certainly see that <laughs> there is a big difference in maturity of our customer base. <clears throat> and, and so you could say, for some customers, we basically say, no, we don't want to go in and, and have a dialogue about that because you, 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 you're not even ready to take very, very simple steps, right? But, but for many, for instance, we can go in and say, okay, this is the big picture, but let's concentrate on detect to correct. Most organization has a reasonable set of, of practices around the run stuff, right? Uh, they might still have chaos, they might still have 50 systems and, and what have I just to manage events, etc. Uh, but, but then you can start uh, building up a, where are you maturity-wise and how can you get to that better end state on detector correct. But they're not ready to talk with, on, on any of the other ones. We see the, the, um, the request to fulfill. Very few companies today are actually mature enough to really have the right dialogue around this. It's, it's, you need to be where you really realize that in order for IT to uh, survive, it needs to become a service broker. And, and, and a lot of people can say that word today, they couldn't a couple of years ago, but they still don't really have a clue as to what it means. 
right? Uh, it basically is something we need to do in order to avoid uh, being taken over by Amazon or something like that. But but uh, but having that dialogue is, is is difficult. So there certainly is a maturity uh, uh, thing involved in this. We would, uh, and and even if if if. Charlie is, is, is saying, well, it's, we have to be careful about formal maturity models because they can be dangerous. There is an idea about having a basic understanding. What does it mean to, uh, to be able to start tackling one of the value streams, right? I mean, it's also how we uh, work ourselves. I mean, we use scenarios, and those are business-driven objectives that we want to reach. So it's not like we just talk about, oh, we want to do something around one particular problem. And I think that's also what we're looking for from, from the community here, to help us understand which scenarios are relevant in the market at this moment in time. That will help customers, the organization that will adopt this, to say, okay, so our problem is X, so there is a scenario that describes how to solve that using the advertising action and take it from there. So we don't necessarily need a maturity model to find out gaps. There's always something that is bugging the minds of people and how it should be solved. I think that's an approach that we're more keen to than the only uh, uh, maturity one. I do think that it's necessary to have something like that, uh, to have a starting discussion point. Uh, but yeah, it's not the only point. Hmm. And again, it's something that's high on the agenda for this group this week. Okay, further questions? I'm seeing no hands moving. It's, it, it's been a long but very, very memorable day. So what I'm going to propose now is that you join me in thanking the wonderful team of experts. It's my honour to lead. Um, and I will give you a head start towards either the bathroom or the bar to help us celebrate it. Thanks again for your questions. And thanks for the forum.